bisa duduk di depan supaya fotonya lebih bagus gitu <laughs> silakan jadi nanti teman-teman eh, mahasiswa yang datang juga nggak bingung karena eh, tempatnya di sini sudah terlalu full bisa ke depan ibu Sentia ibu Titi ibu Iha ibu Santa Pak Yusuf Bu Hamida, Bu Eska, 
Oh iya, Pak Burhan jangan lagi ke belakang. Daku Maha Eta ke sini yuk ke depan. Untuk teman-teman mahasiswa boleh di uh, WhatsApp ya temennya ya untuk lebih cepat lagi karena dari jam setengah sembilan tadi narasumber kita sudah datang, sudah hadir di lantai dua. Yuk, uh, bisa, bisa ke depan aja deh, ke depan aja deh. Yuk, yang belakang ke depan katanya Pak Isu. <laughs> Yuk. Yang pakai baju oren tuh, ke baju oren dari mana ya? Dari DLM, oh Promkes, luar biasa loh cinta banget sama <laughs> alma mater. Ayo, ayo, yang paling belakang, penuhin dulu yang di depan. Iya. Yang di depan ada hadiahnya loh. Asik. <laughs> Silakan, terutama mungkin dosen-dosen yang dari keperawatan karena topiknya nursing disaster management. Jadi mungkin lebih nyambung. Silakan. Kenapa bu di lain dua bu ini bu lain pertama masih kosong untuk untuk bos-bos yang ini Bu, yang pinky. Baiklah, tidak berhasil tampaknya. <laughs> ayo, ayo, yuk. Yang lain terakhir, yuk. Pindah ke depan. Ayo. Yang ini juga deh, yang ini juga. Yuk. Eh, kenapa pindahnya ke sini? Di depan, 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 depan. Ayo. Bukan, bukan. Yuk. Kan nanti mau jadi dosen juga. Ya kan? Lecturer. Future lecturer. Itu dua, tiga. So from now on we want to try just try okay just try to speak in English uh, as uh, I know that I'm not fluent in English too so we just have to try okay <laughs> since our speaker cannot speak in Indonesia so we have to do the English how are you guys Fine, thanks. Okay, fine. I'm fine. Thank you, thank you. Oh, ada fine. yang ada yang dari Zoom ya? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, Zoom. yes. Can I can I see your yes. face, please? Oh, hello everybody. Hello everybody. Hello ma'am. Hello, good morning. Hello ma'am, good morning. Hello, hello, good morning. Hello. Oh, where are you from? Balik ke Jakarta. Bandung. Bandung. Dasar. Tasik. Tasik. Okay. Solo. We will try in English, okay? Since I'm not fluent, so maybe we can both uh, try to speak in English. Are you yes. agree? Yes. Where's yes. yes. the camera? There. Yes, agree. Okay. Okay. We will have discussion later uh, after the presentation. So we, you can have the question. Uh, You can write down in the chat room, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, physiotherapy student, where are you? Raise hand, raise hand. High enough, high enough. Okay. 
is just four. Maybe Mr. Yusuf can help. And then nurse from from nurse. Where is it? Okay. And then TLM Technology Laboratory. Where is it? Okay. So, uh, ini ya. Saya pending dulu. Nanti kita lanjut sebentar. Kita ikut dulu zoom ini. Kebetulan zoomnya adalah zoom. Baik. Terima kasih ibu. Baik, nanti untuk hostnya siapa ya? Pak Samet ada di dalam ya? Ada? Tidak ada? Mas Dodi? Mas Dodi, oke. Okay. Nanti kalau misalnya ada yang bocor suaranya, minta tolong langsung di mute ya. Oke. Okay. Tadi baru absen uh, Physiotherapy student, TLM, TLM, where are you guys? TLM? No? No. Midwivery student? Midwivery? Health promotion? Yes, okay. It's just three of you. Can you WhatsApp? Can you give information to the others? Okay, thank you.
What's up? Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, before we begin the this event, uh, I would like to invite the director of Health Polytechnic of Jakarta Tree. Siapa? 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 Siapa?
Okay, to uh, Mrs. Shelby, Miss Shelby, and Miss Taren, and our moderator, Miss Ola, can have the seat in front of us. Miss Tanner, please. Miss Aaron, Miss Aaron. <laughs> Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nancy Meilan. It's a precious chance for me to be your master of ceremony on this very special occasion, the lecture class with the topic nursing management in disaster. First of all, let's say thanks to our beloved God who has given us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy so we can attend and participate in this special event without any obstacles. And I would like to say uh, welcome to the honorable guest lecture from Belmont University, Mrs. Shelby and Mrs. Taren, Miss Taren. And then uh, welcome to Indonesia, welcome to our campus. The honorable Mrs. Yupi Supartini SKPMSJ as our director of Health Polytechnic of Jakarta 3, the lecture from nursing, midwife, and technology, medical of laboratory, and from physiotherapy also. My beloved alumni and our student of the Poly Health Polytechnic of Jakarta 3. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya. Poltekes Jakarta 3. And I forgot, I forgot the uh, participant in our Zoom meeting. There are 300, 300. There's a lot of uh, participants. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Hello from Lampung. Hello. Oh, from Hello. Lampung, from Bandung. And? From Medan. Medan, Horas. Padang, selamat pagi. Selamat pagi juga Bapak. Padang, Padang. Padang, Padang, Sumatera. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi, selamat pagi Manado. Manado. Manado, Manado. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi Kendari. Palu. Morning from Lampung. Palembang. Can we see the, uh, the participant face in the Zoom meeting, please? Put in the gallery. Okay, say hi, everybody. Hi, 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 Bu Ita, ya. ya ampun ya, situ sampai bingung Gendut. bu, saking <laughs> harus pakai bahasa Inggris, jadi rasanya deg-degan gitu. <laughs> Gak lah, bagus banget bahasa Inggrisnya. Oke, okay, thank you, ma'am. Oke, okay, on yeah, this special morning, we have several agenda as follows. First, we have opening and then opening speech from Mrs. Yupi yeah. Supartini. Main lecture from Belmont University, the last closing and tour of campus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin this event by having opening speech from our Director of Health Polytechnic of Jakarta 3 to Mrs. Yupi. The time is yours. Thank you, Ibu Nessie. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
Waalaikumsalam. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Miss. Uh, the Excellency, our uh, special guest lecture from Belmont University, uh, Miss Sally Garner, Selby Garner, PhD, RN, CNA. This is too long. <laughs> FAN, uh, and also she is the director of Global Health Innovation, professors of nursing. So welcome to Jakarta. Welcome to our Polytechnic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Terin Pekon, uh, MSN, MTS, FNPC. The Global Health Coordinator. So welcome, Miss uh, Terry, to our campus and also to Jakarta. Uh, this is health, one of health polytechnic uh, in Jakarta. Thank you for your uh, coming and your uh, uh, time to deliver the guest special guest lecture to us. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the excellency to all the oh uh, we have a director ibu ita ibu ita stayed in the zoom yeah yes. thank you miss uh, thank you ibu ita we okay. have also ibu dr sri wahyuni in the zoom meeting ibu good dr morning. sri wahyuni good morning, yeah. good morning ibu <laughs> good morning director shelby and mr in thank you for coming Good to see you, Jakarta. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibu. Teman-teman uh, semuanya. So all the management staff in Head Polytechnic of Jakarta Three, Vice Director One here, also Vice Director Two, two Vice Director Three, and uh, all the management staff. Oh, forgot. There is also Ibu Ayu here. Ibu Ayu Dia from DG, <laughs> Secretariat of DG. Yeah, uh, uh, introduce uh, everybody. Ibu Ayu is also from Director General, uh, especially in Secretariat uh, Director General. All the lecturer from nursing, physiotherapy, uh, med medical technology lab, and also midwife. Yeah, school and all the students and also the alumni uh, who could attend uh, directly in this room, yeah, in this theater room. Uh, so welcome to all of you. And also uh, all the lecturers from several health polytechnic. Bapak, Ibu, thank you for your attending in this Zoom meeting for the special guest lecture. It is very a uh, pleasure to have both of you, Ibu Sel Selby and we call Ibu, <laughs> Miss Selby and Miss Terin. Yeah, it is very special uh, time for us, special occasion for us to have you, both of you, and uh, we'll have a very valuable information and knowledge and uh, about the disaster and um, disaster nursing management, yeah? especially how uh, the management use in the USA. So we we really uh, think that this is very good uh, opportunity for all the lecturer and all the students to have the perspective. Uh, abroad, especially in USA. Yeah. Hopefully, one day we could also go into Belmont University. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the lecturer, the students. Yeah, so please study hard and go into the Belmont University for the for the uh, what is it? Maybe master or PhD level. Yeah. Jadi belajar giat ya untuk seluruh mahasiswa ada kesempatan insya Allah ya. 
So again, thank you very much. And also to, to all of you, uh, please pay attention to all of the lecturers that will be delivered by both of uh, our uh, special guest lecture. Uh, maybe this is only the, the place that the, the guest lecture uh, rely, yeah, but we are all of, over how much? Around 20, around 20 health polytechnic uh, from all the participants uh, joined by Zoom. So this is actually national guest lecture. So thank you again for your opportunity and uh, sharing all your knowledge to us. And also thank you to Ibu Dr. Sri uh, who facilitated who facilitate this uh, guest lecture, Ibu Sri. Have a successful event. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ibu Sri. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that is a special, special uh, only some, some words. Yeah. <laughs> so again, welcome to Jakarta. Welcome to Head Polytechnic of Jakarta 3. Welcome to uh, Head Polytechnic Ministry of Health in Indonesia. So uh, we have we'll have a good time with you. Thank you. Terima kasih Ibu Yupi untuk bisa menghangatkan suasana. Boleh dong tepuk tangannya. And we have a big applause for Mrs. Yupi. Thank you for your speeching uh, opening speech. And the next agenda is the main lecture with the topics nursing management in disaster. Mrs. Paula Cristanti as head of educational development center will be the moderator of this activity. Please welcome Mrs. Ola. The time of the presentation is about one hour and then we will have 30 minutes to discuss. Mrs. Ola, the time is yours. Thank you, Ibu Nessie. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. The Honorable Director, Ibu Yupi Supartini, SKPMSC. The Honorable uh, Dr. Sri Wahyuni, Ibu Sri. Thank you for facilitating us. Terima kasih, Ibu Paula. Thank you. And the honorable other directors from some of the health polytechnics that following by Zoom. And the honorable guests, Dr. Selby and Ms. Taren. And all the lecturers from Jakarta Tree and all students. We have four majors, nursing, midwifery, Technology Laboratory Medic and Physiotherapy. So uh, this is belong to four majors. And all the participants from uh, that following this event uh, from Zoom. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Sebelum saya memandu uh, diskusi ini, before I before I deliver time to first to Dr. Selby, I would like to read her curriculum vitae. Name Selby Garner, PhD, RN, CNE, FAN. Very long title. <laughs> Uh, the nation, of course, USA. Uh, currently, her position is Director of Global Health Innovation from Belmont University, USA. Uh, Department of Nursing, and uh, her background is uh, uh, online from BSN until PhD from Texas Women University. 
And uh, working history until now, she's become a professor of nursing at Belmont University. And, uh, and also working uh, with some project with US Agency of International Development or, or USAID. So uh, Dr. Selby, times for you is 30 minutes to present and then uh, I give the time without further ado to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tarima Kasi, um, director and Ibu UP, um, uh, Ibu uh, Nasi and Ibu Pala. Um, uh, Salamat pagi. <laughs> Uh, that is where my knowledge of Indonesian language ends. <laughs> I don't uh, don't know much more in uh, Indonesian language. So um, anytime, uh, Paula, if you want me to stop and if you need to explain, let me know. Okay, but she said many of you understand uh, English. Uh, so that is uh, very good. I'm not so talented. <laughs> So it is so nice to be here with you today. It's an honor for me to be here and to see nurses and healthcare providers around the world and to get to know you. It's a, a true honor for, for me. Um, I'll um, have them pull up the presentation and start talking a little bit. I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about some of the projects that I've been involved in and then talk about a disaster management project that is funded by the World Health Organization and United Nations. One thing I want to inspire you about is nurses and healthcare workers can be involved on the global level. It doesn't have to always be physicians that are involved. You can be leaders and policy makers as nurses, as physiotherapists, as allied health. And those are um, very important positions that you can play a role in. We know with nursing, it's very important to be able to manage individual care. That's the most important thing that we learn. But you can also be um, impactful on a global le level. And so I just want to give you some examples of work that I've been um, honored to be involved in that um, were international and global. Okay, so the PowerPoint, please. Mm. Astudi, the PowerPoint. Uh, no, the other one. Yang pertama tadi. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Thank you. And you can advance the slide. <laughs> so um, this one. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Okay, next slide. So I come to you from Belmont University. Belmont is located in Nashville, Tennessee in the United States. And Nashville is also known as the country music capital of the world. So do any of you listen to country music? Yes, country music. What are some of your favorite artists? Anyone have favorites? John Denver. John Denver, Country Road, Take Me Home. Oh, John Denver, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any others? Daniel. Oh, Carrie Underwood, yes, she's one of my favorites too. Good. So many of those stars come to Nashville, Tennessee, and our university is actually located right at the end of what's called Music Row, where they have a lot of producers. So Belmont has a big music school, and it's known for being a big music school. But also, our second biggest program is nursing. So it's a lot of fun when you go to Belmont campus. You'll be learning about nursing, other health programs. But as you walk through the campus, there's someone playing a guitar by the fountains and so songwriters that are writing songs. And who knows, they may be the next Carrie Underwood. So it's a lot of fun to see uh, diverse talent at Belmont University. Um, you can see where it's located here in the United States. Um, so it's kind of a little bit in the middle uh, to the eastern part of the United States. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. 
this is just a picture of our nursing school and our uh, nursing lab where the nurses are working at the university. Next slide. So for the last about 12 years, I have been honored to be involved in international nursing. And I worked with several colleagues. We, we began doing work like this where we were working with nursing schools across the world. And we decided that um, there was not a lot in nursing theory about uh, working internationally with each other and partnering. So we developed a model based on the research that was available at the time and also our experience for partnering internationally with other organizations. And um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the model because I know you um, go to theory classes, right? And you can spend a whole hour talking about theory. But um, one of the very first strategies in developing partnerships is establishing relationships, which is what we're doing here, getting to know you and establishing relationships with your director and your professors here. And so um, we were able to publish this model in a journal called International Nursing Reviews, which is the official journal for the International Council of Nursing. Next slide. So some of the early research that I did in my profession internationally was interviewing nursing students and health students such as yourselves. Um, I was doing this in India, and what we found were that um, nurses in India felt like many times they were not valued in society and that uh, nursing and medical were very hierarchical. And so they really wanted the community to know what nursing was about. And we've been talking about with your director this morning about nursing being a very valuable position and how much nurses do in society. And so we want for people around the world to recognize the importance of nurses because nurses make up the majority of frontline healthcare workers in Indonesia and also around the world. And so what we found were that nurses had a very strong desire to um, work to the full scope of what they were educated to do. And they also wanted to learn about technology and be empowered to use that technology around the world when they're practicing in nursing. And so we published some of these results. And then we started to think about where are we going to get some funding to accomplish our goals. Next slide, please. Next slide. And so our vision was to recognize and uplift nurses in India. I was working with a hospital in Bangalore, India. This is my colleague, Lena. Lena is from uh, Karnataka, India. And she had a vision that she wanted to start the first center for nursing excellence in India. And so we thought, how are we going to do this? Um, so we uh, started to look for funding and think about ways that we could empower nurses. And she had a vision and a dream for opening the first simulation center for nursing excellence in India. Next slide, please. So we had to look for some funding and we uh, wrote applications. And this is where we used our previous research. So how many of you have had a research class? Have any of you had your research class yet? Do you have research class in your nursing program? Yeah, yeah. So um, we learned to, we use the research to then um, write grant applications to ask for funding. And uh, we did that through USAID, uh, through Fulbright, um, and through uh, U.S. India Education Foundation and other funders. Next slide. And we were awarded a grant by USAID. Ah, that would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, by USAID to open a, a build a simulation center for nursing excellence in India, where people from India now, from all over India, they go there to train 
with the simulators and we do a lot of education with communication with physicians and nurses that empowers nurses and the rest of the healthcare team to establish trust, also to increase their critical thinking and to increase their decision making. Uh, we've published a quite a variety of outcomes that came from the work that we did in that simulation lab so that we could uh, hopefully replicate this model in other countries. And that's some of what we're hoping to do here in Indonesia as well. We never anticipated when we built this center of excellence, we never anticipated COVID. Uh, but the Center of Excellence was actually turned into a vaccination clinic during COVID, uh, and many thousands of people came to get their vaccinations in this uh, center. So we were very excited that it was to be able to be utilized for that when the nursing school was shut down. They were able to give vaccinations in the center. So these are some of the students just like you that I've worked with in India. We also received funding to open an innovative um, living and learning center with smart classrooms in um, uh, this facility. And you can see here the nursing students doing some of their online work that we presented from the United States. And so we were able to work together to um, establish this center. The next project I want to tell you about is a project to um, increase learning on non-communicable diseases such as hypertension and diabetes. So in India, there were a lot of access through smartphones to different types of media, but all of that media was made in the West. So in the US or the UK, and so it didn't really translate to the diet that they had in India. So we wanted to create some uh, apps and we created mobile health apps that used cartoon features to talk to people about things like diabetes. Because in rural India, people were still very um, uh, hesitant to even talk about diabetes. If they felt like it might be shameful and we wanted to change that perception. So people would come in and get their blood glucose and their uh, blood pressure monitored. So we made these animated apps and uh, we did a variety of research on the effectiveness of the apps. And these were funded by the US India Education Foundation. The last project that I'll talk about here before I talk about disaster management is a women and children's healthcare and research center, which was also funded by USAID. And so this is a picture of inside of the center where we have pediatric uh, palliative care unit inside the hospital and um, a pediatric ICU that was also started with the funding. This is what the hospital looked like before uh, we had the grant. And then after, this is what it looked like when we built the Women and Children's Center. Um, part of something I'm very passionate about is students going and presenting the work that they do at different conferences around the world by doing poster presentations to, um, to help other nursing students also be inspired to be a part of projects and to do research that's evidence-based. And so these are just a few of the um, students that have gone around. The next project that I'll talk about is the disaster response project that I've been involved in that's funded by the World Health Organization and the United Nations. So um, two weeks ago, we were in South Korea and people from all over the world, including physicians, nurses, uh, professors, public health authorities came together from uh, many different countries to have um, to provide recommendations worldwide for mass disaster repair, preparedness and response. We were uh, charged with assessing community resilience against a disaster and determining how we could improve community resilience so that we are prepared for mass disaster. 
And so the importance of uh, resilience is that it really helps us to absorb shocks and be prepared so that the impact is minimized on the community. And that's why we want to um, prepare and uh, have resilience against disaster. We used a framework that was developed by the United Nations to um, uh, look at health emergency and disaster uh, risk management. And then each country held their own workshop to decide on a local level the best types of interventions and strategies to prepare for the next disaster. Um, this talks about just the process we used for each country and uh, some of the barriers of uh, bringing people together to do this type of work and the importance of that. So some of the key aspects when we're prioritizing for mass disaster is to look at things like governance, financing, health workforce, public health functions, and medical products and technologies. These were all things that we considered when we were prioritizing and we were ranking what we, uh, our recommendations. So we used what was called a public health resilience scorecard. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment that was developed by the United Nations. And it, it aligned with that disaster response framework that I told you about. And uh, then we use this scorecard. It's a tool for ranking. With this scorecard, we wanted to identify, rank, and prioritize actions. And these are all the countries that were involved. Australia, Bangladesh, Brazil, Chile, Nepal, Slovenia, Turkey, and the USA. But um, as I was preparing to come to Indonesia, I inquired, and they're actually now doing the scorecard ranking in Indonesia as well. So the UN uh, offices here in Indonesia. So you may start to hear about this in the future, the scorecard ranking methodology. So again, this just tells uh, shows a little bit about the strategies for ranking and some of the um, uh, priorities, uh, some of the, just the methodology for how we went through the workshops to rank the uh, priorities. So this is an example of, uh, we used a Delphi methodology. How many of you have heard of Delphi methodology? Have you heard of that? It's a research methodology that um, we used when we were together as a group to decide we, we had 70 from all of the countries, we had 70 priorities. And yes, as uh, your director is saying, Adelphi takes those and it shrinks it down to a manageable number. And it's where you have experts that are surveyed over and over until everyone has consensus and agrees upon the strategies that we're going to use. So the very first uh, one was where we took the 70 recommendations of all of the countries together and we looked at whether we should keep, remove, or clarify the things that were on the list. And so the thing that is in yellow is something that uh, we were going to talk about because it was maybe going to be thrown out. And so we had decided ahead of time what numbers we would use to throw something out or to clarify it. And I'll show you the next one. So then once we did that, we did a Likert scale and we looked at the, the ones that we wanted to keep again or the ones that we wanted to remove or discuss and clarify. And so we did this process several times until we finally came to the uh, final results. And the final results resulted in 23 recommendations that we have now that the World Health Organization will publish. So I'm not going to go through all 23 recommendations, but I do want to just talk about a couple of those. 
And the very first one that every country agreed upon that was a priority was assessing mental health needs in communities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think as nurses sometimes uh, and healthcare providers, we are trained to always think about physical first because we're thinking about the physical needs, but sometimes we forget about the mental needs of others. And so we talked about this at this workshop, no matter what the disaster is in the future, whether it is um, earthquake, flooding, whether it's pandemic, the need to deploy mental health professionals very quickly and post pandemic because we have many people that are in um, post-traumatic response, uh, you know, that, that have a lot of um, issues related to the pandemic. Many of my colleagues in India, when they had the Delta wave there, you remember seeing on the news how um, bad it was, and people were dying outside of the hospital, and many of the healthcare workers had um, you know, severe uh, post-traumatic after that, after dealing with that. And so it was very important for even the healthcare workers to have the mental health resources for them afterwards. So that's one recommendation that the World Health Organization will be putting forward, um, along with strategies to achieve these things. So I won't go into that for every single one. But um, other things were, you know, each community needing to know exactly how many um, individuals can be received by each hospital and um, strengthening infrastructure. Because we found during the pandemic that uh, public health officials maybe had an idea, but they really didn't truly know uh, which hospitals could take how many patients. And so we wanna strengthen infrastructure. So there's several more recommendations. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to give my uh, colleague Taryn time to talk about um, infection control in the pandemic and also her experience working um, in the pandemic. So I will uh, just finish up this one. And I hope that uh, I can continue to keep in touch with your professors here and that we at Belmont University can establish a partnership and uh, come back and um, continue to, to talk with you all about issues that we could partner with and learn from each other. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Sarin, before you uh, bring your presentation, uh, perhaps if you could have some words to, oh, no, <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay, thank you. So you may continue. Uh, Mas Dodi, presentasinya yang tadi yang pertama ya. Perfect. Uh, my name is Taryn and I am the Global Health Coordinator at Belmont University. Um, and I will... Um, Oh yeah, Just, before before continue, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> read your curriculum PT. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, her name is uh, Miss Taryn McCoy. And uh, the position now, current position is Global Health Coordinator from Belmont University and Department of School of Nursing, uh, of course. And then her education background is online from uh, bachelor nursing to the master. And then also you took a uh, master of theological studies, right? And uh, working history is a uh, pediatric nurse, adult nurse and nursing faculty instructor. Thank you so much, you may continue. So I'll pick up where uh, my colleague left off at and talk a little bit more about disaster response, but I'll focus a little bit more on the infectious disease side of things. Um, Um, so a little bit more background on me, just so you know um, my experiences. Um, I got my bachelor's of nursing, uh, which is similar to an S1 program here um, in 2014. And then I worked in adult uh, um, multi-organ transplant for three years, and then pediatric surgery, trauma, and transplant for four. Um, I started doing global health work in 2017, and I've now done work in multiple countries throughout Central America, South America, Europe, and West Africa. 
Um, and then specifically just wanted to highlight uh, COVID responses I've done since that will come up later in the presentation. Um, so I did COVID responses in Italy in 2020, Chicago from 2020 to 2021, Mississippi in 2021, and then Tennessee in 2022. So those are various places in the United States um, that have different, uh, that were variable experiences depending on the uh, pandemic state at those times. So I'll highlight that a little bit later on, but just wanted to introduce that now. Um, and then I graduated with my master's of science in nursing in 2022, so about six months ago. Um, so the global importance of natural disasters is increasing um, actually with time. So we're seeing uh, natural disasters around the world happening at higher frequency and intensity. So they're happening more often and they're more devastating every time. Um, and so I'm sure you all have seen that in the most recent years, um, uh, especially most recently happening in Turkey with the devastating earthquakes that happened there. Um, and so we're also seeing infectious disease rates um, increasing throughout the world, both connected to natural disasters and apart from natural disasters. And so that makes it a really prevalent topic for right now to be talking about how do we respond to natural disasters. Um, we, uh, the global health community has taken more of, um, has realized we need more of a prevention approach as well as being able to take care of them after they occur. And so that's part of why we um, will share this information today to sort of get you all thinking about um, how to prepare for these things if they were to occur um, where you're working. Uh, we are also seeing a strained international health system post pandemic. Um, and so that occurs with both the nursing um, side of things, but also a lot of other parts of healthcare. Uh, have been strained. And so that's everything from the supply chain. So things like having access to good protective equipment, um, to the medication systems, um, and various different things. So we're seeing a lot of challenges in healthcare right now already, even without a natural disaster occurring. And then we've also seen vaccination rates decline across the world because of a decreased access to healthcare systems. And so that puts uh, a lot of communities, especially those with low resources, at particular risk for infectious disease right now. And so the number one risk for infectious disease post a natural disaster actually comes from displacement. And so displacement is when people are forced to leave uh, where they're from and move to a new area. And so uh, this will happen after essentially uh, either a a, a hurricane or an earthquake where they can no longer live in their previous home. So the community has been destroyed. And so they have to move to somewhere new. When they move to somewhere new, it's usually a, a very crowded environment with very limited shelter and very limited isolation opportunities. So a lot of people living in really small spaces with very few um, sanitation services. So hygiene services, toileting services, and often really limited access to clean water supplies. Um, and so you see the biggest infectious disease uh, risk post disaster happening when the displacement risk is highest. Um, and so that means if a whole community has been wiped out and they're all migrating to somewhere new, that's when you see the biggest rates of infectious disease increase. Um, the importance of this uh, specifically in Indonesia is, uh, is critical because Indonesia's ge geographic location poses a risk for multiple different kinds of disasters as well as simultaneous disasters. Um, and so we'll talk about just one of those examples, but uh, they're at risk for both uh, earthquakes and uh, flooding happening simultaneously. So having one disaster happen and immediately after having another. Um, and so that poses a unique risk um, as well as the tropical climate of Indonesia, which is lovely for us coming from the US, um, which is not very tropical. Um, it creates a higher risk for infectious diseases. And so uh, a warmer climate um, tends to have higher um, vector borne diseases, which we'll talk about just a little bit later. And then it's a highly populated country as well, um, which is wonderful because we get to meet so many of you all. Um, but it also means that displacement risk is much higher. So you would, um, if a whole community is having to move, that's already a really big number. Um, and so that just increases all of those risk factors. And then the vaccination rates have dropped due to the challenges of the pandemic. And this has happened all over the world in every single country. Um, but I, uh, in researching for this, I found that 
uh, Indonesia had the fifth highest rates of vaccination before the pandemic. And so 93% of the population was fully vaccinated um, against a number of childhood diseases specifically, uh, which is excellent. But just like everywhere else in the world, it's been harder to access those vaccines um, throughout the pandemic. And so they've dropped to 84%. So oh, uh, just about 10% in the following two years um, during and after the pandemic. So in the Indian, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 that occurred here, it was one of the most severe natural disasters in history, starting with the 9.1 magnitude earthquake that occurred, um, and then the subsequent tsunami that hit the Sumatra region. And the reason why I bring this uh, incident up specifically is because it's actually something that um, has transformed natural disaster responses around the world. So um, after the devastating effects of this tsunami and earthquake, um, it actually put into place a lot of the policies that we'll talk about today and things that um, Shelby has already spoken on of disaster preparedness things. And so after the um, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami occurred, they began to do warning systems and preparedness drills in regions that were particularly prone to these uh, natural disasters. They even installed, this is beyond my expertise, but they've installed sensors in certain places uh, in the earth below the ocean to uh, trigger warnings when things like these uh, earthquakes and tsunamis may occur. Um, and that's specific to this region. And so while the effects of the uh, natural disaster were devastating, it also became, um, began this uh, worldwide conversation on natural disasters. And a lot of really good protocols and policies have come from um, what happened here. So I'll talk a little bit about these seven specific diseases because they're the most important post uh, disaster. Um, I won't spend a ton of time on each one, uh, but just give some general overview um, to each one and kind of how to differentiate them. Uh, does anybody know what is uh, similar between cholera and typhoid? Any guesses? There's a lot of things, so you're probably not wrong. What's that? <laughs> diarrhea is right. Yes, they both have diarrhea. Um, and how do they begin? What, what starts them? What's that? High fever. Yep, you can see that in both of them. Yeah, and so we would classify them both as um, they come from bad water or poor sanitation services. And so the first one we'll talk about is cholera. And so there's an average of one to four million cases worldwide every year. Uh, this disease is interesting to speak on right now because there's a current outbreak in Malawi, which is in a southern region of Africa. Um, and they've already had more fatalities from cholera this year alone in the first three months than they have had in multiple years combined in past. Um, cholera is a disease that we're seeing at increased rates all over the world, um, both connected to natural disasters and without it. And so it's one to really keep on your radar as you go forward. Um, it's an acute bacterial disease caused by the ingestion of contaminated food or water. And so the contamination of food or water can come from a lot of things, um, but it's the number one connection with typhoid is that they um, both have contaminated food or water that starts the illness. The, I'm actually going to go back one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so the hallmarks is, um, symptom of cholera is uh, extremely watery diarrhea. Um, it starts between 12 hours and five days after consuming that source. And so that's really important um, in natural disasters because uh, you might see a patient after they have left their home region, you may not be in the town that the natural disaster occurs in, but even five days later, you could start seeing those symptoms that may have actually started um, a few days prior. And so it leads to severe dehydration. It's fatal if it's untreated. And so especially in your pediatrics um, population that have that are already really susceptible to dehydration, this is really important to think about. You would treat it with either IV fluids or oral rehydration uh, uh, solution. And so that's like um, a little bit of an ion mixture that you mix into water to give them extra electrolytes. And then you would treat them with antibiotic therapy as well. Um, this is preventable with clean water sources, sanitation services, and vaccination. Um, one thing I want to point out there is that uh, you'll see this both with cholera and typhoid. You can uh, 
there's a lot of push after natural disasters to vaccinate all the populations. And that's really important. But if you don't treat the water source and the sanitation services, it will just continue to come back. Um, and so it's critical after a natural disaster to not only uh, get the antibiotic treatments going for patients and vaccinations, but to also make sure that there's clean water and sanitation services where they're living at. Typhoid is the second disease. So that's gonna be 11 to 20 million cases worldwide every year. And so that's even more prevalent than cholera. Um, the, it's an acute bacterial disease caused by ingestion of contaminated food and water as well. Um, where you'll see a difference between cholera and typhoid is that typhoid typically presents with the very high fever before they have abdominal pain and problems. And so, uh, I've taken care of a number of these patients who have, um, temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius when they arrive, uh, so hot that you, uh, we joke that you feel them come in before you see them because they are so hot, their, uh, their temperature radiates. And so they, um, especially in pediatrics, it will be um, fatal if it's left untreated as well. Um, you treat them with uh, very similar uh, treatment to cholera with IV fluids, oral rehydration system, antibiotic therapy, and then because of the high fevers, you'll really need to do a lot of antipyretics, so Tylenol and such, to bring down their fevers. This is also very similar, and uh, it's preventable with clean water sources, sanitation services, and a complete recent vaccination series. So typhoid vaccines don't last for a lifetime, uh, like some of the other ones do. This one needs to be updated fairly regularly. So even if a community had really good typhoid immunity a few years ago, it might not still be relevant now. So it's important to know uh, when the most recent typhoid vaccination was given to a patient as well. Um, the next we'll talk about is pneumonia. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because um, there are, you, I'm sure you talk a lot about pneumonia in your other courses, but specific to natural disasters, you see the pneumonia risk increase in patients who are very vulnerable. And so that's pediatric populations, elderly populations, and those that also have different respiratory and cardiac problems already. And so uh, that is when, um, when they're in the displacement uh, areas, so in different refugee camps and such, um, there's a lot of spread of just regular colds, viruses, and respiratory illnesses. For most people, they might catch that and it might they might be fine. But for your patients that are already susceptible to severe illness, that um, their risk is really high. So it can be fatal for them as well. Um, they also have decreased air quality in these uh, regions post disaster because of the debris, um, the water sources that have come in from flooding areas and such. So that creates a really vulnerable uh, situation for these communities. Um, your symptoms are going to be cough, shortness of breath, and fevers. And then in the elderly population, it would be confusion as well. Um, the treatment for pneumonia will vary based off of the um, bacterial or viral etiology. All right, then we'll go into malaria. And so this is the vector-borne disease that we uh, mentioned earlier. So um, if it comes from a bug or an insect, that kind of thing, we typically call it vector-borne. And so malaria is uh, 247 million cases worldwide every year, um, and it's transmitted through mosquito bites. So the hallmark symptom is going to be fever, headache, and chills that start 10 to 15 days after. And so that's another thing that you'd want to be mindful of, even if you aren't in the region where the disaster hit, is that it can take place up to two weeks afterwards. Um, prevention is available through uh, vector control. So that's the mosquito nets, bug sprays and such. And then you can do some uh, prophylactic um, medications as well. Um, there's a very limited number of cases in Jakarta and Java, but in other regions of Indonesia, which is the, I hope I don't pronounce this wrong and I'm sorry if I do, but the Papa province and the... <laughs> Perfect. <Hola. laughs> do you want to take the next one too? East Nusa? Uh, East Nusa Tenggara province. Yes. And so um, it's it's pretty um, almost over 90% of malaria cases occur in Africa, actually. But these two regions of Indonesia have particularly high rates of malaria still. Um, and so if you were caring for a patient from that region, it's something to keep in the back of your mind as well. What's much more prevalent here, though, in this region is uh, dengue. 
And so there's over 100 to 400 million cases worldwide annually. And this is um, very, very prevalent in the Indonesia region. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this because I'm sure you cover this a lot in your classes. Um, but this is an important one to uh, keep in mind. Uh, you've got high fever, headache, body aches, and nausea four to seven days after the infection occurs. Um, there are, uh, this region of uh, Southeast Asia has some of the highest case numbers in the world. And so um, it affects, even if you were caring for patients from different population groups, you'd want to really consider this. Um, and there's one vaccine available for prevention. However, it's only available if uh, you have very severe, um, a history of a very severe case. Tetanus is the final one I'll mention here, and that is um, a bacterial infection that occurs post-disaster in open wounds. And so there's a lot of debris and dangerous things that float around after a disaster um, from buildings that have collapsed, um, that has washed up from the ocean. And so a lot of people get cuts and open wounds. You want to consider a tetanus vaccine for those patients um, always because um, the tetanus vaccine does not last a lifetime either. And so, um, and the treatment for it is very difficult to obtain, um, even in the best of conditions, but especially in a post-disaster response. And so, um, if an open wound is seen and the patient doesn't remember their last booster shot for tetanus, you want to think about just giving them one. The risk of um, giving them an extra tetanus shot is very low, but the risk of tetanus being a debilitating and fatal disease um, is very high. So you would um, err on the side of caution and just give them the tetanus vaccine usually if there's an open wound. And that's a practice that we have in the United States as well. Um, and it's pretty common internationally, um, if you're concerned at all about tetanus, to go ahead and treat it. And so there's a few other conditions here that are prevalent that I won't touch on specifically, but um, measles, hepatitis, leptospirosis, bacterial meningitis, E. coli, and then these final two um, are specifically relevant in Indonesia. Um, and so that's why there's an asterisk by them, um, but we won't spend a lot of time going through all of those. But um, if you wanted to look into a couple more conditions, this is where you would start. Does anybody know the condition that we uh, had mentioned that we haven't talked about yet? That you might be worried about? Even now? Can anyone think of the last condition we might talk about? It starts with a C. <laughs> That's right, COVID-19. Very good. Perfect. So COVID-19 um, was a disease that I spent a lot of time treating in various parts of the world. Um, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's also an interesting disease to study now, three years since it began, because we've seen the role of the nurse evolve throughout the pandemic. And it's been a really great time for nurses to really advocate for their professional role um, and the difference that they can have in communities as they respond to this infectious disease. So this is a hospital that I worked at in Italy as the pandemic hit the north region of Italy. So I was in a hospital in Cremona, about 40 minutes outside of Milan in um, throughout March, April, and May of 2020. Um, you can't see it in this photo, but the hospital is right behind it. And so we were an extension service. The hospital had been um, overloaded with patients. Um, and you'll see that in the case study I present at the end. Um, but we came in and created an extension unit and cared for patients in these wards. And so you can see it was very large. We had two uh, a adult male wards, two adult female wards, and two ICUs um, and to take care of extra patients. So we um, tried to offload about 100 uh, patients from the hospital at any given time. Um, so in total, we cared for about uh, just under 1,000 patients in our time there. Um, so I, uh, for COVID-19, um, you've got an acute viral respiratory illness. It initially emerged in 2019 and then reached global pandemic status in March of 2020. 
Um, very similar to pneumonia in how it presents. So it's cough, fever, congestion, and shortness of breath. Most recover without treatment, um, especially now. However, um, for those that are severely ill or have immunocompromised states um, and the elderly population, we've seen them have extremely severe cases of COVID-19 um, that can be fatal. Um, new treatments are emerging, uh, but they're typically reserved for extreme cases and conditions, and they're not always available worldwide. Um, there's uh, prevention through mass utiliz utilization, isolation of infected individuals, and vaccination of general populations. There's multiple vaccines now approved across the world. Um, and I mentioned this isolation piece specifically because this was a huge reason for the spread of COVID-19 was the inability to isolate certain individuals um, or failure to comply with isolation protocols um, that helped uh, the disease take such a threshold across the world. It also poses a, an extreme risk post-natural disaster, um, likely for the next 10 years or so, or even longer because of that displacement risk. So if you are in very crowded communities post-natural disaster, you really don't have the ability to effectively isolate. So this is a photo of me um, from the war, just to give you a perspective on the uh, personal protective equipment or PPE that we wore. And so you'll see starting from the bottom, we were in boots that came up to our knees um, and then scrubs underneath a gown. We were on, we were wearing double layered gloves at the time, an N95 respirator, a hair mask, and then a face shield. Um, and so we were wearing about eight layers there to protect against, uh, against COVID-19. And then uh, we also would do chlorine washes in and out. So whenever we were taking off our equipment, we were washing each piece with chlorine before we touched it. And so that was an extra method that we also used to prevent even transmitting COVID-19 to ourselves from the personal protective equipment we were wearing, because all of that has been exposed to COVID-19. So it's important that as you're taking it off, you're also thinking about um, not touching it and uh, washing your hands before and after. Um, chlorine is a solution that if you're ever involved with infectious disease around the world, you'll often use because it's uh, extremely um, uh, bactericidal. I don't know if that translates, um, but it, it kills many different kinds of bacteria and, uh, and viruses, and it's extremely cheap. And so you can get it at large quantities all around the world um, and have no real issues with that. It's, a, it's typically also very easy to keep and maintain. And so if you ever are in infectious disease, you'll probably use chlorine to help sort of with those protocols. Sorry, this slide looks a little bit funny in here, but the um, I just want to touch on infection prevention and control because we saw this happen around the world where different nurses were exposed to COVID-19 through caring for their patients. And so I just want to highlight that um, safety prevention and guidelines for infection prevention and control are really for the safety of the patients, but also for the safety of staff. If all of the nurses in a community get infected with COVID-19, it hurts the general population and it hurts um, your own families, your friends, and your personal life. And so oftentimes as nurses um, and as different healthcare professionals, we get very worried about treating the patient. And we can do that sometimes um, to risk of ourselves. And so the most important thing that you can do if you want to take care of your patient well is to follow these uh, the infection prevention guidelines and not run into a room um, without your PPE on, um, even if you think it would be better for the patient, it's probably not. Um, them having a nurse who's protected means that they have a nurse for many, many days who isn't sick um, at home. And so we've seen this in certain communities where infection prevention protocols weren't followed well. It's um, really depleted their nursing staff. And so that puts them at risk for a long, long time in their community. And so I just want to reiterate that it's uh, really for your own safety to follow those infection prevention guidelines, and it's for the safety of your patient. It uh, always seems like it would take a long time to get dressed before you can get in, but it's really uh, it takes on average about two minutes, depending on the degree of PPE that you need. And so um, while that two minutes feels long when your patient is, um, is right in front of you and needing your help, it actually helps them for uh, not only in the future, uh, in the short term, but in the long term for the whole population. And it also protects your families, your friends, and those sort of things. 
So I just wanted to touch on the different nurse roles that um, have happened during the pandemic. Um, in just three years time, um, a nurse has often taken on many of these different roles as the pandemic occurred. And so you had your clinical nurse who was de delivering patient care at the bedside for the patients and the populations, um, both in hospital and clinic settings. You have your community nurse who was decreasing further spread of the illness um, through uh, contact tracing and prevention efforts in various location settings. Some of them working from home, some of them working from a public health office, um, different embassies um, and aid offices. You also have nurse researchers. So they were directly reporting how patients were responding to COVID-19 treatments. And so if you remember in March and April and May, um, there were many changes to how COVID-19 patients were treated. Um, you may have seen that with your family or friends or just from reading the news and seeing that things were changing quickly. Most of that was coming from nurses at the bedside, taking care of patients and then reporting how they were responding. So if a patient did well after something or if they did bad after something. And that changed all of the medical practice guidelines. And that was largely started by the nurse reporting. And so it was a, a really amazing time for nurses to be able to really change policy um, and guide how uh, medical care was being decided. Nurse educators were providing uh, up-to-date health information and supplying individuals, healthcare staffers, and communities with accurate information. Um, most of the world was quite scared at the beginning of the pandemic because they didn't know um, how it would all go. And nurses didn't have all of the answers, but they had a really good science background to interpret some of it. And so that really helped to get good information out to people right when they really needed it. Um, and so their nursing background played into how they were able to share that information and share it in a, a patient friendly way. And so we get really good as nurses at teaching through doing things at the bedside with different patients of different education backgrounds, languages, uh, and cultural differences. And so that really played into how nurses were able to educate for, uh, through the pandemic. There was also nursing leadership, um, managing interdisciplinary teams, complex staffing ratios, updating hospital infection prevention protocols, and then ensuring sa uh, the safety of their staff through PPE compliance. And so nurses uh, were leading different hospitals and clinics, um, making sure that their staff had good patient ratios so they weren't taking care of a whole ward by themselves. Um, they were making sure that the staff had the the PPE that they needed to care for the patients. Um, and they were also helping manage uh, a team of many different professions, uh, including lab techs, radiologists, uh, doctors, nurses, and et cetera. And then as the vaccine became available, nurses really led the charge on vaccination nursing. So they um, coordinated and delivered COVID-19 vaccines globally. And then uh, that was seen in hospital, clinic, and community settings, just like Shelby pointed out um, in the large clinic that they were able to open in the simulation center. And so nurses largely did much of that coordination effort. So there are many opportunities in any sort of, um, both in disaster response and uh, without disaster response to, for the profession to grow and change and evolve. Um, we saw all of this really highlighted in a really short amount of time in just three years. Um, and this is just the surface of how many different roles nurses took on. And so I, I hope that excites you about how many different things you can do over your profession, um, if that much was possible for even just a single nurse over three year time. So lessons learned from um, infectious disease in the field. Um, so in many of my responses I took on in the United States, um, one of the most important um, lessons I learned was about teamwork, um, not only amongst nurses, but amongst uh, other interdisciplinary teams. And so um, the number of patients were was really high and they had really complex needs. And so it was really difficult to take care of a lot of patients at one time. And so we really relied on teamwork um, with other nurses to get through um, various shifts that were incredibly difficult and really complex patient cases, high number of medications, et cetera. Um, it was also necessary to develop trust between staff and uh, work together as one. And so we saw teams of doctors, nurses, laboratory techs, radiologists really working as one to care for patients um, because the patients needed a lot of services. And then patients will often transfer multiple times through their admission um, because they were, they came in kind of sick, they got really sick, they got a little bit better, they got worse again. And so they didn't follow a straightforward trajectory. They often um, had a little bit of highs and lows throughout their illness. And so it was really important to 
communicate clearly between different um, different units of care. So whether that was the community clinic or the hospital ICU or the hospital wards, um, it was important to clearly communicate that. And then as well with patients' family members. And so patients' families couldn't be at their uh, at the bedside. And so it was really important to keep them up to date with how the patient was doing um, and to give clear communication because they already felt very afraid because they couldn't be with their loved one as they were sick. Um, and so that taught us a lot about how to clearly communicate with family members um, and other staff members across the hospital. Um, I showed this picture. This is also in Italy. Um, and you all can't see this because we're all in our protective gear. Um, but this picture includes doctors, nurses, radiologists, paramedics, um, and nurses from multiple units. And what we were doing in this photo is uh, we had stepped outside of our wards. Uh, we were still in our isolation areas, um, but we were cheering for a patient who was across the unit um, who was getting discharged. And so we really saw all of our patients as being all of our patients. Um, and we didn't say, oh, this is this is your patient and not mine. Uh, we really celebrated our wins and our losses together as a family of, uh, of different healthcare professions. And so that teamwork dynamic played out. And then it also helped our patients to develop sort of a team um, approach to overcoming the illness. And so we cheered for each other. Um, we grieved together when we lost certain patients. Um, and we certainly celebrated the wins when someone would get to go home. And then this is one of the teams I worked on in the United States, um, and this is our nursing team. Um, it was quite small. And so what you'll see here um, is that we had ICU folks here, um, and then a few folks who were in the male ward, and I was in the female ward. And so during this response, something that was unusual about it was we would often have many patients in one ward one day, and then it would totally be different the next day. And so we, um, just like I kind of said before, we saw all of our patients as being one. And so sometimes you would be in a very, uh, a unit that was very um, not busy that day. And so we would change our nursing to have the most nurses wherever there was the most need. And we didn't get stuck on this idea that I was in the female ward one day and I needed to be there the next day. We really saw all of our patients together. And I think that really sustained us, even though we had a very small team, we always worked together and saw our patients as one. Um, and that was truly what made this response possible at all. Um, because the, the, patient challenges were very difficult um, and their um, acuity level was very high. And we couldn't have taken care of the number of patients we did without really strong teamwork between a lot of different units. And so I'll go into just one patient story before I wrap up. And so this is in Italy. Um, we had a patient who arrived at the emergency room uh, with her husband in March of 2020. Um, they were both severely ill and COVID-19 positive. Um, they stood together for multiple hours in a line outside of the uh, emergency department waiting to be admitted. Um, the hospital was extremely full, um, and this was not uncommon for many elderly patients. Um, think of your grandmothers and grandfathers waiting for 6, 12, 18 hours, some even up to 24 hours outside of the emergency room to even be evaluated. And so they had stood there for many, many hours, um, and then they eventually were admitted. In Italy, they separate their units between male and female. And so he was admitted to a ward and she was admitted to an ICU um, and they separated at that time. And then she was eventually transferred to me 10 days later. She was improving, but still very ill. And um, when she came to me, she was very, very ill and had just received the worst news of her. Life. Um, her husband had passed away in the ward um, while they were separated. And the day after she transferred to me um, was his funeral that she would she was not able to attend. And so this was very important to her through her faith, um, the funeral service. She was Catholic and uh, the funeral service has a lot of importance to their religion. And so she was very, very distraught. Um, and as you can remember from the PPE photo that I showed you, um, we were we kind of looked like aliens. They could only see our eyes in these uh, suits and we spoke a different language. Um, she was Italian and spoke only um, Italian and I obviously speak only English. And so it was really difficult for me to understand how I would be able to care for her um, as she went through the hardest day of her life. Um, and she and her husband had been married for over 60 years at the time. Um, and I remember her saying to me, I, 
I knew that we would eventually pass away, but I never thought that I would be separated from him at, on, on, um, when he, when he died, that was the thing she could not, uh, under, she couldn't, uh, really understand how to work through because she had never imagined something so terrible. And, um, she was very, very elderly. And I remember getting dressed in my PPE as I was going into the unit on the day of her husband's funeral. And, uh, it was kind of a time when I would get dressed, when I would think about my patients for the day and think through how to care for them. Um, it was kind of like putting on my armor for the day. And I would always pause and think about them before I went in. And I remember that day specifically getting my PPE on and thinking, I have no idea how to do this. There is, uh, you have a great nursing school, but they will never teach you all things. And I certainly felt like I had no clue how to take care of this woman as she went through this incredible trauma and tragedy. And I remember thinking to myself, if all I can do is make her feel not alone on the worst day of her life, then that will be, then that I, I just hope that that is enough. And I went into the unit and I took care of her for 14 hours. And I remember those, it was a very hard day. And I remember just holding her hand often and at times crying with her and uh, sitting by her bedside as she just mourned the loss of her husband and the loss of how she would be able to take care of him at the end of her life. Um, they had, um, been, they had spent their whole life together getting married as young teenagers and now we're separated at, at the most important part. And she had a very difficult day and, uh, I never felt like I was, I never felt like I was doing enough. Um, you can't bring anything into these units and you can't take anything out. And so I couldn't even, usually I think about bringing food or flowers or all of these things that you can do when someone has lost somebody important and I couldn't do any of them. And, uh, I felt really like I hadn't done enough for her on the worst day. And as I was getting ready to leave at the end of the day, um, I was helping tuck her in to bed for the night and, uh, she starts speaking to me in Italian and I can't understand it. And so I, um, had one of our translators come over and the patient repeated, uh, told the translator and, and she held my hand and she said, today was a very hard day, but I never felt alone in it. And it transformed how I think of taking care of patients in the midst of natural disasters and infectious disease, because that was the one thing that I thought, if I can just do this, then maybe it will be a little bit better. But even when I was doing it, I didn't feel like I was making a difference. And so I say all of that to say that sometimes you will be in disease states or natural disasters where patients are going through things that are beyond what you can imagine. And it feels so big to overcome and you feel like you don't do enough. And I just want you to remember that if you can make a patient not feel alone in the midst of their tragedy, you're still doing really important work as a nurse. And it's one of the best parts of our job is that we get to uh, sit beside patients and hold their hand and comfort them. It's not a less important part of our job than the, all of the clinical things that we do for them. Um, and in, especially in cases of natural disaster and infectious disease, where the needs are so great, it's easy to lose sight of that more than ever. And so I just want to encourage you that in nursing, you will often feel the, uh, the gap between what you can do and what a patient really, uh, you think a patient needs, but it's just as important to sit beside them and hold their hand as they go through tragedy as it is to be able to meet all of those needs. Often you won't be able to, but you'll still have that chance to make them not feel alone if only for one shift or one hour. So thank you for joining um, this global nursing community. There's such a great need and we're so excited to have you be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for both presentations. It's very great to hear from uh, all of your experience. Uh, before I open the term for discussions, perhaps I will uh, deliver in Bahasa first to make the audience understand about what's your uh, presentation. Okay, pertama, uh, um, Dr. Selby itu membawakan tentang pekerjaannya yang uh, di mana 
uh, melakukan penelitian secara global itu untuk uh, ke nursing students khususnya, di mana penelitiannya uh, mengarah kepada manajemen disaster dan disaster preparedness. Dan uh, fokus uh, pekerjaan beliau saat ini adalah di India dan uh, mulai tahun ini uh, mulai uh, uh, proyeknya di Indonesia. Dan um, semua yang dikerjakannya itu uh, di, mengikuti pedoman yang di, 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 dilakukan oleh WHO. Kemudian uh, satu proyeknya adalah uh, mengembangkan Nursing Excellence Center di India untuk uh, bagaimana mempersiapkan perawat-perawat di sana untuk menghadapi uh, bencana yang ada di tempatnya masing-masing. Karena memang Uh, tidak semua tempat mempunyai uh, uh, natural disaster yang sama. Sementara uh, dari Tarin itu membawakan tentang uh, natural disaster dan uh, persiapannya juga penyakit-penyakit yang sering terjadi yang uh, dihadapi pada saat uh, pasca disaster. Dia menyampaikan uh, tentang uh, penyakit kolera bahwa, bahwa terakhir adalah Malawi yang tertinggi, kemudian Uh, pneumoni dan juga malaria yang disampaikan di Indonesia itu terutama di Papua dan NTT. Kemudian yang populer di kita juga ada dengue dan uh, yang paling banyak ditemukan kalau itu uh, disasternya melibatkan banyak uh, bangunan yang roboh itu adalah tetanus karena adanya luka terbuka uh, setelah disaster. Nah, kemudian uh, Tan juga menyampaikan tentang pengalamannya pada saat uh, menjadi perawat di uh, COVID-19 di uh, uh, sebelah utara Italia, tepatnya di dekat Milan pada tahun 2020. Uh, disampaikan tentang uh, bagaimana uh, ternyata lesson learn yang didapatkan bahwa teamwork pekerjaan uh, dalam kerjasama tim itu sangat membantu karena yang dihadapi adalah pasien-pasien uh, yang begitu banyak, begitu membudak, dan juga mempunyai kebutuhan uh, yang begitu kompleks yang harus dihadapi. Sehingga ternyata kerjasama tim antar uh, health providers, antar tenaga kesehatan itu sangat penting. Kemudian adanya uh, pemakaian klorin, ya kalau di kita mungkin baik clean ya, klorin itu sebagai protokol untuk uh, uh, untuk uh, hygiene uh, sanitasi ya. Dan um, terakhir disampaikan uh, case of Italy, jadi uh, dia mendapatkan pasien suami istri. Kalau di Italia itu pasiennya dipisahkan wardnya pasien uh, pria dengan wanita, kemudian uh, sudah sangat tua dan pasangan ini sudah menikah selama 60 tahun dan uh, suaminya kemudian meninggal dan istrinya tidak tahu bahwa suaminya sudah meninggal. Jadi uh, Terin harus menyampaikan kepada pasien itu dan dan dia mempunyai kendala bahasa karena dia hanya bisa bicara dalam bahasa Inggris dan pasiennya hanya bisa bicara dalam bahasa Itali. Dan uh, apa yang uh, didapatkan bahwa ternyata menjadi pendengar yang baik dengan duduk di sampingnya dan tidak membiarkan pasiennya itu uh, kesepian itu men ternyata menjadi satu obat tersendiri uh, di samping dari pengobatan yang diberikan. Mungkin itu uh, resum dari pembicara uh, uh, keduanya. Oke, okay, uh, I will open the term of discussion. Please, any questions? Perhaps from uh, the audience in the fourth floor first. Uh, Mas Do, eh, apa Mas Moko, tolong siapin mic ya. Any questions? Ya, yeah. from students, from faculty member. Oh ya. Yeah. Oh ya, yeah. we have our alumni also <laughs> that present this attending this uh, event. Yeah. Oh ya, yeah. Bu Butias dulu. Ya. Yeah. Shortly, I will open the discussion uh, for the, the participant from the Zoom. Okay, Ibu Tias. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will translate. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps directly to answer, this is the question for Taryn. Uh, she would like to know about the role, the role of nurses. Uh, uh, in her opinion, that uh, you mentioned about the role in COVID, uh, but how uh, the role of nurses in uh, disaster preparedness or disaster nursing? Yeah, uh, great question. So the um, the role of nurses in natural disasters is big, um, and I think Shelby's presentation touches on that too. Of uh, how nurses are involved in the preparation state. So uh, nurses are involved in making sure communities are ready for natural disasters if they occur. Um, there's a whole team of them working around the year to make sure that uh, that nurses and healthcare communities are ready for disasters if they occur. And then when they hit, they can take on any of those six roles that were listed. And so sometimes they're doing, uh, they're taking care of the patient. Sometimes they're taking care of the staff um, through infection prevention and uh, management things. Sometimes they're changing the national guidelines on how to take care of patients through reporting outcomes. Um, sometimes they're teaching other nurses how to take care of patients. And then other times they're out in the community educating people. Um, and then they're also often um, helping in the community uh, analyze what needs there are. And so there are a lot of uh, changing needs in the middle of a natural disaster, uh, especially if it's um, like a earthquake that has usually ruined homes. Um, that really helps figure out where there's clean water sources, where there's a need um, for different sanitation services, um, and they help direct people to where to get those services at. And so nurses, uh, in most disasters and infectious disease responses, nurses are one of the most needed professions um, across the board, um, no matter where you're at. Usually there's the highest number of nurses, um, even more than uh, than doctors or um really any other profession, um, just because they can be used in so many different ways. Um, but like I said, it's really important to have a big team of lots of different people um, and to rely on one another to take on those different roles. Ya, jadi Bu Tias itu perannya lebih uh, banyak di pada saat disaster preparedness. Ya, jadi uh, tidak hanya uh, terjun langsung merawat pasiennya, tapi juga terjun ke community untuk me menyiapkan mereka terhadap uh, kemungkinan bencana yang akan terjadi. Kemudian uh, juga uh, ter terlibat dalam uh, merubah uh, guidelines khususnya untuk uh, bencana yang disesuaikan dengan uh, uh, bencana yang terjadi pada saat itu. Kemudian juga um, mengajarkan uh, sesama perawat untuk uh, kesiapan terhadap uh, disaster ini. Juga mengajarkan kepada masyarakat uh, tentang uh, bagaimana uh, menyikapi terjadinya bencana. Juga melakukan anisa kebutuhan masyarakat banyak sekali peran yang bisa dilakukan dan dan itu uh, memegang peran penting juga pada saat terjadinya bencana. Tapi tidak terlepas tetap kerjasama tim uh, merupakan satu hal yang sangat penting. Mungkin itu ya. Cukup jelas? Oke, okay. very clear. <laughs> Oke, okay, any more question? Oke, okay, I open, I invite the question from the chat room. From the Zoom, any question? Okay, before from Zoom, please uh, mention your name and then raise your question. Uh, please, Mike. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. Okay, you may raise. You may stand up so everyone will see. Thank you. Uh, 
perawat pintunya dong. Iya, pintunya saya pakainya untuk untuk ngumpulin sedikit. Siapa namanya tuh? Pinti. I think this question can be for you both. Uh, she asks about the who actually that uh, play the, the important role uh, uh, except nurses. I mean, who belong to the, the, the teamwork with, with uh, health providers that uh, especially to, to uh, face the disaster? Um, I think the entire health team that you work with um, on a daily basis in both hospital and community setting play a very vital role. So from nurses, physicians, all of your respiratory therapy, physiotherapy, um, uh, lab, all of those uh, different key players, in addition to public health professionals. I'm not sure how it works in Indonesia, But in the U.S., there is a public health specialty, public health degree, and that degree really focuses on infrastructure in a disaster. And in our workshop with the United Nations and World Health Organization, there were many people with public health degrees that had very valuable insight as to how to roll things out logistically, almost like a civil engineer you know, for healthcare, uh, because they're able to see the bitter, bigger picture and know, they know their counties or their regions very, very well. Um, that's an important thing for them to know. In some parts of the United States, uh, nurses are the public health care director, but most parts it's held by someone with a public health degree. So um, I'll let Taryn answer from her perspective too. Yeah, I, um, I agree. It's a really big team that responds to any natural disaster. Um, and one of the other areas uh, that you touched on is engineers. Um, we work with a lot of engineers um, because they are the ones who can get clean water and create sanitation services. And so if you don't have clean water in a community, you can treat them for cholera and typhoid and uh, many other diseases as much as you want every day perfectly and they will still get cholera and typhoid uh, because of if you don't address the water and the food um, and the toileting, they, they cannot um, overcome the illness. And so engineers are a really important part too of um, being able to look at um, how the community is getting water. And then nurses typically are the ones who educate the community then on where the clean water is and isn't. And so um, we work really closely with engineers as well to make sure that they have good water and they know where the good water is. I worked on a project once in West Africa and a great um, organization had dug a new water well for clean drinking water but the community was still drinking from the uh, from the river. And that was simply because they didn't know that the river uh, wasn't clean and the new well was. And so for many years, they continued to have typhoid and it wasn't because the well was bad or the water was bad. It was simply because they didn't know. And so it's important to work together with uh, your whole team because um, nurses typically are the ones who will educate in the community after things like that have occurred. And so they can help um, uh, tell the community the information, the health information that they need to, um, to stay healthy as well after treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Indri, jadi uh, semua yang memang bekerja baik itu di uh, lahan uh, rumah sakit ataupun uh, komunitas itu bisa bekerja sama. Jadi perawat, dokter, fisioterapi, laboratorium medis ya. Tapi tidak juga terlepas peran penting dari kesehatan masyarakat ya, petugas kesehatan masyarakat. Jadi ini lebih karena mereka kalau di US ya itu difokuskan pada pembangunan infrastrukturnya. 
Kemudian uh, ditambahkan juga oleh Terin itu uh, sanitasi lingkungan ya karena itu uh, seperti teknik sipil pada uh, pelayanan kesehatan karena untuk uh, memastikan adanya air yang uh, bersih kemudian juga toileting. Dan uh, seperti pengalamannya di, di Afrika Barat bahwa ternyata uh, masyarakatnya tidak tahu bahwa air sungainya sudah ter uh, Uh, apa namanya sudah tidak bersih uh, sehingga peran perawat di sini di samping juga disediakan air yang bersih memberikan uh, health education kepada pasiennya kepada masyarakat tersebut cukup jelas oke okay, very clear thank you <laughs> terima kasih ya yeah. uh, invite yang jelas. Hmm. yes so, ya yeah, please uh, mention your name and then from where And then raise your question. Hello. Hello. Okay. So why waiting from the Zoom meeting? Okay. Yours at the back. Yeah. Please. Ya, yeah, stand up and then uh, mention your name and then raise your question. Please, Mas. Mic-nya, ya. Yeah. Terima kasih. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm very, very sorry I was coming late, so I don't know if my question has been explained before. So it's a very simple question. Uh, so uh, I'm physical therapy student, so I need to know what is uh, that's physical therapy is. Uh, have a test with wall in uh, natural disaster mission. Thank you. Your name, please. <laughs> My name is Bimo. Bimo. From physiotherapy, right? Bimo. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. And to Apni. Surita. Um, physical therapy has a really big role, especially in earthquakes. Uh, and so many, uh, many times I've seen physical therapy deployed, uh, not right when the disaster hits, but actually in the six months and uh, one year, two years after a disaster. And so in earthquakes, a lot of people break or lose limbs. And so what a big role for um for physical therapists is in helping with prosthetics or helping them learn how to be mobile without that limb or that extremity. And so it's a really, really important role. I was in Haiti in 2017, um, which was about six years after that very major earthquake that occurred there. And they had just started getting the prosthetic um, into the country. And so there was a large need for people to teach them about the prosthetic. Um, and that's really a role uh, that physical therapists at are much uh, more educated in than nursing. And so it's really important. Sometimes it occurs a little bit after the disaster, um, but it's just as important as all of the uh, needs that occur immediately after. Yeah. Bimo, how? It's very clear. Okay. I would say if I don't know when you're graduating, but this earthquake that just occurred in Turkey um, and in Syria will see a physical therapy need um, mm -hmm. that is very great in the next six months and one year. Um, so that's where it looks a little bit different than nursing, but it's just as important. Yeah. Thank you. Udah mau lulus belum sih? Oh, the last grade. So, final year. <laughs> Sampai dengan tahun uh, satu tahun ke depan itu Turki masih membutuhkan fisioterapi. Ayo fisioterapi pergi ke sana ya. <laughs> Tepuk tangan buat fisioterapi. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> ya. Yeah. Uh, oh ya, yeah, di chat. Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Um, I couldn't see. Let me see. Um, Miss Nessie, please read for me. <laughs> hmm. 
Hmm. From who? Mistriani. Uh, one by one, I think. From Mistriani. So you got the questions? Okay. okay. Cool. Um, we discussed this in our UN meeting because we had some um, uh, people from Turkey there, a physician and a nurse from Turkey who uh, just experienced this terrible earthquake. And um, one question we had worrying coming from the U.S., there was a lot of aid. And we worry because sometimes people can get in the way when they don't know the culture and it can make things worse. And they um, were very supportive of health professionals from around the world coming, but they did acknowledge how important it is for people to have training. And that also includes cultural training. Um, but we did, you know, many times use interpreters. Uh, they talked about many of the um, uh, local students from university coming and interpreting, which was very helpful. But I do think uh, what the um, the person that asked the question said about cultural um, knowledge is very important that we understand and recognize. Uh, sometimes it's just as important as the physical need uh, meeting that cultural need. Uh, Taryn probably has some more direct experience, so I'll let her answer. I would just piggyback off of that. And especially what she mentioned about translation, um, depending on the translators, um, it will really affect the care you're able to deliver in these situations. And so um, many times uh, people think of the translators as just helping, but they actually are one of the most important people that you have on your team. Um, they're not less important than those who are delivering the medical care. Um, it is vital because the translators, if you are, um, when we go into natural disasters, we typically hire translators first um, before we ever even open the hospital or the clinic because the translators are often from the area that we're, uh, that we're caring for. And so the translators will teach us a lot about the culture and they become a little bit of a barrier between us and them um, because they're able to say, oh, they said this, but what they mean is this. Um, and they'll protect us from saying something that might be seen as offensive. So we think of our translators as a uh, the really important middle ground to help um to help level the, the uh, to help us understand the culture um, and to make sure that we never offend. And they also um, help us because we can be offendable too um, from thinking that a patient is uh, being, uh, is saying something offensive because they will translate it for us and also allow us to know the meaning behind it. I also think it's really important that um, it, like I mentioned, being in the hospital uh, for COVID-19 when we were in a lot of PPE um, and they could only see this much of our face, um, it really helped them to know that there were fellow uh, Italians in the unit. So that felt like a safety net for them to know that they were also being cared for by their own people. And so I would say whenever possible to use local staff as much as possible um, is most important of all. And it becomes a really great opportunity to um, share knowledge and skills and to learn from one another because we all have something great to offer um, and we're at our best when we're working together. Thank you. I think Ms. Triani already understood about the answer, right? Okay, I will limit for one more question, Ibu Desi, please read. One more question from the chat room. Did you work with local residents also? Yes. I feel like the last question kind of covered that, so I won't go down that again. Done? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Please. Okay, one more, yeah. One more. <laughs> uh, Ichaya. Oh, yeah. yeah. Please introduce yourself, yeah. Thank you. Stand up, please. Yes. 
a very great presentation. Uh, my name is Lisa Lima. I'm to be in chat. Uh, I'm very touched by your experience while on duty during the COVID-19. I also had a similar experience uh, to become the COVID-19 volunteer in 2020. However, the obstacle, most of the health provider here have never been trained to deal with uh, was such a disaster. In your opinion, what are the things that uh, need to be prepared or improved for health providers so that when a disaster occurs, we are ready to deal with it? Thank you. Um, this was one of the major topics from the UN and World Health Organization uh, was to make sure that we take all of the lessons learned and evaluate those on a global level so that we can uh, put forward more strategies for the future. And so we're really calling for nurses and uh, health workers to do research in this area so that uh, we can take those lessons forward. And so I think your point is very important. We all know some informal lessons that we learned about PPE and about uh, making assumptions. Uh, you know, in the beginning of COVID, we thought you had to be symptomatic, remember, uh, to spread. And then we learned through the data coming in that we needed to very quickly start to analyze that data and make recommendations based on the science. And uh, so that was another thing that we talked about on the clinic, being, uh, being able to quickly verify evidence-based information and disseminate that to the public in a way that was um, both verifiable, but done in a quick manner. And that was very tricky during COVID. Yeah, just on a tangible example from that, we I remember when we first uh, arrived in Italy, we were treating um, every patient with a certain type of steroid. It was like a part of the protocol. And even in the weeks that I was there, that no longer became protocol. We found out it wasn't helping. And so uh, I don't think I touched on this bullet point on one of the slides, but it, I would say the most important thing you can do, and this is exactly what Shelby just mentioned as well, is stay really up to date with the information as it comes out. Um, you'll, if something occurs or a pandemic or a natural disaster, you want to learn right away about the everything that happens. But then sometimes we get really busy treating it and we forget to come back to the information. And so I think it's really important to stay up to date um, with the specific disease and the specific region, because often how you treat a disease will also vary based off of where you're located at um, and what's available right there. And so I would say that's one of the most important things that you can um that you can instill is getting accurate and up-to-date information for all health professions, not just the people who are making, who are writing the orders, um, but from your doctors, to your nurses, to your lab techs, to your, um, to all the staff that helps um, because everybody needs to be protected and delivering the most up-to-date care as possible for the benefit of um, each staff, each patient and the whole community at large. I'll also say that I think the, um, the community gets information later than the health professionals. And so anytime that you can educate the community about the health information that you've gotten, um, it's really great too, because then you're um, sharing information that's accurate, up-to-date and evidence-based, um, which really helps um, a community as they're grappling with fear about a new disease or a new disaster. And so I think that's where a nurse um, can really make a big difference as well in the community. Okay, Cha. Yeah. She is our chief of disaster task force. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, please give applause for Dr. Selby and Miss Darren. I'm so sorry uh, because the time is limited. I couldn't uh, go through for another questions. Perhaps all questions already cover uh, that answer by uh, both of them. Thank you so much for your great presentation. And then thank you for all the participants from the Zoom also, and then uh, from participants in here. So thank you so much. I deliver back to the MC. Ibu Nesi, please, thank you.
Yes, thank you. Give a big applause for Mr. Jordan, Ms. Lana, and Ms. Lincoln. That's the lecture from Mrs. Salami and Ms. Lana. Thank you for your very good lecture. May all of us get the value and benefit from this lecture. Uh, that's it. One more time. Thank you. And I will invite Miss Yubi to give a souvenir or something to remember about the of Jakarta Tree.